Happy Easter, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our online service. My name is Joel. I'm the discipleship pastor here at Eaglemont. We're so glad that you're with us. If you are new to Eaglemont, a special welcome to you. Today, we get to celebrate the resurrection and life of Jesus Christ. That's what Easter is all about. And we're so glad that you're a part with us as we have time to sing songs and also read from God's word. If you're exploring Eaglemont Church, a special welcome to you today. We would love to answer any questions you may have please go to eaglemont.info and click on the I'm new button so we can touch base with you. Or for those of you who are in person, you can get the I'm new card out at the back table in the lobby. Fill it out and put it in the black box that is there at the back. Thanks so much for giving us the opportunity to connect with you and help you to find a place of belonging here in the Eaglemont Church family. Our annual congregation meeting will be on Sunday, April 23rd at 11.15 a.m. If we are back, in our building by that time, it will be in person immediately after our Sunday gathering. If we're not able to be back in our building, it will be a Zoom meeting at the same time and date. Please mark April 23rd at 11.15 on your calendars. The Zoom link for this meeting will be available at eaglemont.info. Thanks again for your patience as we wait on the time to transition back into our building. Prayer Encounter is next Sunday, April 16th at 6 p.m. at Pastor Marlo and Miriam's home. You can get the address by going to eaglemont.info and clicking on the prayer encounter button. Church, can I encourage you? There is nothing more powerful or important that we get to do than to pray together. It's in prayer that God unites us, speaks to us, empowers us, heals our brokenness and gives us vision. Please make engaging in this corporate time of prayer a priority in your life. Keep up to date on what's happening around Eaglemont Church by signing up at eaglemont.info to receive our monthly newsletter. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Let's just spend a couple moments centering our hearts and our minds again on the one who we've come to meet with as we've come to meet with God today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, would you prepare us today to meet with you? We thank you for the ability to celebrate the resurrection and life of Jesus. As we read from your word, as we sing songs together, we just pray that you would be the focal point for all of us. 
and again you would remind us of the sacrifice you've made and the mission that you've called us to partner with. Thank you for this time we have together. In Jesus' name. Early on Sunday morning, as a new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. Don't be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. For God has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. All praise to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again. Because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, now we live with great expectation. I consider it a privilege to share this Easter message with you today entitled, When Death Died. New Testament scholar N.T. Wright points out that there were many messianic movements in the first century. In every case, he writes, the would-be Messiah got crucified by Rome, as Jesus did. And in not one single case of these uh, fake messiahs do we hear the slightest mention of their followers claiming that their hero had been raised from the dead. Wright says they knew better. And why? Well, he says, because resurrections were public events. Word gets out about something like that. In the first century, if you were following someone who claimed to be the Messiah and actually wasn't, uh, and he was crucified by Rome, you had two choices, either disband the movement or look for a new Messiah. It's likely, quite likely, that Jesus' followers uh, believed that they were done in the wake of his crucifixion, except that shortly after his brutal death, two things happened. One, witnesses saw that the tomb was empty, and two, many people saw Jesus alive after he had been crucified. And so the combination of those two factors was, was overwhelming, really. Now, if, if it was just uh, an empty tomb, but uh, Jesus did not appear to anyone Skeptics could justifiably say, well, the body was stolen from the grave. Must have happened that way. Uh, on the other hand, if people at the time said that they had seen Jesus, but the tomb still held his body, skeptics could rightly say that those people were expressing uh, wishful thinking or outright lying. Let's go briefly to John 8. And Jesus is speaking to the Jewish religious leaders of the day. And in verse 24, he says, Unless you believe that I am who I claim to be, and who did he claim to be? It's undeniable from the, in the New Testament that Jesus claimed to be God, Savior of the world, God the Son, sent from God the Father to bring eternal life to all who would trust him. And these Pharisees, they did not believe that at all. They did not believe who Jesus was claiming to be. And so, and again, John 8, verse 24, unless you believe that I am who I claim to be, Jesus says to them, you will die in your sins. Wow. Death, biblically defined, is separation. Physical death is the separation of the spirit within us, the, the, the true us, separated from the body, the temporary dwelling place of our spirit, physical death. Spirit
spiritual death uh, is, well, you can be alive uh, physically, but if you're not living in relationship with Jesus Christ, that means there is a relational separation between you and God. And if you're living in that spiritual state, when you die physically, you enter into uh, the, the terrible state of eternal death or eternal separation from God, your creator, the source of all life. And that's absolutely tragic, really. Eternity is a long time. And God the Father does not want that to be the case for any of his human creation, which, which is why he sent Jesus, who came to earth to be the payment for the penalty, the just penalty of our sin by bearing it upon himself on the cross and then rising from the dead to prove that he could uh, deliver the gift of freedom from sin and death to, again, to everyone who trusted fully in him. You see, Christianity is unique and distinct from all other world religions in that its founder, Jesus Christ, claims that he rose from the dead. None of the other world religions have that. Huge difference. And millions throughout history have staked their eternal life on this. Many skeptics over the centuries have attempted to discredit the claim, the resurrection claim. Uh, John Sponge, for 45 years, was an Episcopal priest in the U.S., passed away in 2021, wrote a book entitled Jesus for the Non-Religious with a chapter title, The Eternal Truth Inside the Myths of Resurrection and Ascension. Hmm. In it, he writes this, to literalize Easter has become the defining heresy of traditional Protestant and Catholic Christianity. Hmm. To literalize Easter. In other words, to, to believe that Jesus literally rose from the dead. I mean, this guy was a pastor for 45 years. It's clear that he never figured out the Apostle Paul's New Testament, strong New Testament statement in 1 Corinthians 15, that if the resurrection of Jesus did not happen, then we have nothing. There's no Christianity at all. Verse 17 and verse 20 of that chapter. If Christ has not been raised, Paul wrote, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, Paul states. But first, if we're going to talk about the resurrection of Jesus, we obviously must be convinced that he died. Uh, look at the words of Jesus in Mark 10. Uh, the gospel narrative, historical narrative that Mark wrote one of Jesus' followers. He quoted Jesus when Jesus said, the Son of Man, referring to himself, uh, came to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus knew the reason he came to earth was to die for the human race. Now, there's a theory that denies that Jesus died. Uh, very few hold it, but it, it acknowledges that he was on the cross, but claims he merely passed out or became uh, unconscious. Well, it's kind of ridiculous, really. They, they say Jesus somehow revived because he was in a, a nice, cool place uh, in the tomb, in the rock. Well, Roman uh, historian Tacitus and Jewish historian Josephus both confirm as fact that Jesus was crucified and died. And of course, the New Testament record is clear on this as well. One of the examples is that uh, in, in the Gospel of John, it records that the, the soldiers did not break the legs of Jesus, as sometimes they did if the, if the individual wasn't dead yet. But the soldiers that day did not break the legs of Jesus because they saw that he was already dead. And these soldiers, they knew death. The problem with this idea that, that Jesus never died is that it requires us to, to pick and choose only the elements of the biblical account that seem to help the theory while rejecting or modifying those elements that don't. For example, all of the versions of the swoon theory, as it's come to be called, this idea that Jesus only became unconscious or passed out on the cross, uh, this, this theory makes much of the fact that, that Pilate was surprised that Jesus was dead even though he had only been on the cross for six hours, and he knew he was dead. However, the fact that a Roman soldier verified Jesus' death 
must be discounted or explained away. It's just inconsistent. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 8, Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. He was seen by Peter and then by the 12. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom, Paul says, are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. And last of all, Paul says, I also saw him. And you can read about that in the book of Acts, chapter 9. Some have to deny the resurrection of, of, of Christ because miracles are impossible, you know. <laughs> and yet there are some skeptics who are honest enough to admit that if Jesus did rise from the dead, then their life should be surrendered to him. And they're, they're right about that. Theologian uh, Wolfhart Pannenberg says, the evidence for Jesus' resurrection is so strong that nobody would question it except for two things. First, it's a very unusual event, and indeed it is. And second, he says, if you believe it happened, you have to change the way you live. And again, many are not ready to do that. But there are those who have. There are stories, of, uh, contemporary stories of those who have. There are numerous examples, those who have, have done significant research in an attempt to disprove the resurrection and ended up coming to personal faith in Christ as a result. You, if you've been around Eaglemont for any length of time, you've heard me refer to the story of Josh McDowell uh, in the late 60s, a, a, an intelligent university student. After two years of significant deep research to disprove the resurrection of Christ, ended up submitting to the evidence and became a Christ follower and, and wrote the book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict to share his findings. Another example is Frank Morrison, a journalist who, again, set out to disprove the New Testament record of the resurrection of Jesus, ended up placing his faith in Christ and titling his book, Who Moved the Stone? In front of the tomb, obviously. I love it, I love it. So let's look at the case for the resurrection. First of all, there's the empty tomb. It's a good place to start. It was Sunday morning when some of Jesus' followers went to the tomb and were surprised to see the stone moved, the tomb was empty, an angel was there declaring to them the fact that Jesus had risen. Uh, it was such an important uh, news item that God sent a heavenly messenger to let them know, to confirm it, to confirm what they were seeing. The Gospels report that the tomb was found empty some skeptics point to this. They, they say that, well, the four gospel writers each have unique perspectives or aspects included in their report of, of this event. In some skeptics' minds, these so-called contradictions are reasons to disbelieve. Well, those uh, skeptics fail to understand uh, the, the, that those apparent contradictions actually add credibility to the individual accounts, even from a legal standpoint. Uh, you know this. Different eyewitnesses who, uh, who see different things from their perspective actually proves that the various accounts uh, are not rehearsed or, or, or contrived by the group ahead of time. And, and this is the case with the gospel records of this great event in history. Even the usually skeptical historian Michael Grant, former professor of Edinburgh University, concedes in writing. He says, true, the discovery of the empty tomb is differently described by the various gospels. But if we apply the same criteria that we would apply to any other ancient literary sources, then the evidence is firm and plausible, he says to necessitate the conclusion that the tomb was indeed found empty. Wise and uh, honest statement. So many skeptics uh, will agree that the tomb was found empty, but they'll still, they'll still try to explain it away. Some of them will say, well, uh, the disciples stole the body. You've probably heard that one. The disciples stole the body. Well, uh, this can be uh, tossed aside pretty easily. Uh, first of all, there, there were Roman guards set at the tomb, who faced their own death if they failed in their duty of watching over the dead body of Jesus. It's, 
it's just completely implausible that the disciples would have been able to get past those guards to steal the body or to overpower them and, and, and steal Jesus' body. Secondly, even, even if the disciples could have taken the body, they had no motive whatsoever to do so. Uh, if the resurrection of Jesus was just a story they made up after, you know, after stealing and hiding his body, don't you think at some point of the you know, in the disciples' journey forward, they, they would have confessed the concocted lie to avoid the torture and the martyrdom that most of those disciples of Jesus experienced. But none of them, none of them did that. They, they were willing to endure, and they did, uh, terrible torture and death for the truth. N no sane person dies for a lie that they know is a lie. Then some skeptics will say the authorities took the body. Simple question that this theory raises is, what is it that turned the disheartened disciples after Jesus' crucifixion, understandably so, into, turned them into fully committed followers if they hadn't seen Jesus alive? I mean, that, that's a great question. In the book of Acts, after the apparent resurrection, we see the Jewish leaders wanted to put an end to this Christian sect like they had previously wanted to do. Think about this. If the authorities had moved the body from the tomb, why didn't they show the dead body of Jesus when they saw Christianity taking off and spreading so rapidly? I mean, the quickest way to put an end to this crazy preaching of Jesus uh, and his resurrection was to show proof that it actually didn't happen. But they didn't because they couldn't, because they didn't have the body, because he was alive. And then skeptics will also sometimes say the eyewitnesses went to the wrong tomb. Well, this, this smacks of desperation, really. Mark 15, 47 records that some of Jesus' female followers saw where they buried Jesus, okay? They, they loved him so much, it is just, it's highly unlikely that they would have gone to the wrong location just three days later. And even if they had forgotten uh, where the tomb was, remember, they weren't men, so they would have likely asked for directions, right? Uh, I, this objection is, is, is very weak, that the eyewitnesses went to the wrong tomb. Very weak. Then further, in the case for the resurrection, there's the point that that women saw the empty tomb first. Now, follow here. All four Gospels identify Mary Magdalene as the leading woman who uh, discovered the empty tomb. Now, again, don't, don't miss this. In the culture of that time, it's highly improbable that male Gospel writers would have invented this. If the empty tomb was fiction, they would not have said that it was women who first discovered it. Because in that culture, a woman's testimony was considered of little value. However, the gospel writers were not writing fiction. They were concerned about recording the facts as they actually happened, more than you know, looking good culturally. This is, uh, this is no small, small point. New Testament writers cared more about historical accuracy than anything else. That's the point here. Then there are the post-resurrection appearances. We've looked at very solid and historical evidence that the tomb was empty. However, by itself, an empty tomb does not a resurrection make, right? But add to it the experience of people, uh, the experience of many people seeing Jesus alive after the tomb was found empty forms a, just a compelling case for the fact that Jesus was indeed alive. And, and, and please keep in mind, that the four New Testament Gospels have proven in, in other ways, many other ways, to, to be accurate historical records of what took place. Paul's statement, again, in 1 Corinthians 15, about more than 500 people seeing Jesus alive is, is commonly believed to have been recorded within just a few years of the death of Jesus. Therefore, the historical uh, reliability of that record is, is solid and uh, not the result of legend, which some say, uh, but, but legend typically takes years to develop. 
Paul states that, that he, he had uh, proximity to the eyewitnesses. In 1 Corinthians 15, 6, uh, about these people, Paul writes, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. And so, again, Paul uh, either knew some of these uh, people personally and had heard their eyewitness accounts uh, directly, or but he, uh, Paul was told of the resurrection appearances directly by uh, someone who knew uh, a, a specific eyewitness. Now, it was Dr. Luke, and he was a physician, uh, who wrote uh, the book of Acts, uh, which is a history of the early church. And in Acts 1 verse 3, he wrote this about Jesus. During the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time, and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. Powerful statement. And it's, it's worth noting how Dr. Luke is viewed as a historian. Uh, that matters. There's a guy named Sir William Ramsey, uh, a, a noted archaeologist, uh, was skeptical. Ramsey was skeptical of the New Testament book of Acts that Luke wrote, uh, in addition to his gospel by that same name. And uh, Ramsey set out to prove the inaccuracy of this uh, New Testament book of Acts, but instead came away as an ardent believer in its great historical value. Ramsey wrote this, his conclusion, Luke is a historian of first rank. This author, Luke, should be placed along with the very greatest of historians. It's a great comment. It's Luke who accurately records Peter's words in Acts 2.32 where Peter said, God raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses to this fact, he declared in his uh, uh, sermon he was preaching that day in Acts 2. Moving on, Jesus also appeared to women. A again, the fact that uh, in that culture, women are referenced in the gospel accounts adds proof to the authenticity of the narrative. And then Luke 24, Jesus appeared to his disciples, and Jesus appeared to two men on the road to Emmaus. You can read about that in Luke 24. Uh, skeptics have tried to argue that, that these sightings were hallucinations. Um, that actually would be astounding if that were the case, because many different people hallucinating the very same thing over a, a span of weeks uh, in different locations under various circumstances, highly, highly improbable. Uh, we could even justifiably say impossible. Psychologist Dr. Gary Collins writes, hallucinations are individual occurrences. By their very nature, only one person can see a hallucination at a time. So again, we can discard that, I think. In his book called A Case for Christ, former atheist Lee Strobel says, the amount of personal testimony for Jesus' post-resurrection appearances is staggering. He, he puts it this way. Uh, to put it into perspective, if they were to cross-examine each of these eyewitnesses for just 15 minutes each, and you went from uh, you went around the clock without a break, it would take you from breakfast on Monday until dinner on Friday to hear them all. And then he says, after listening to 129 straight hours of eyewitness testimony of having seen Christ, uh, who he says who could possibly walk away unconvinced? But some sadly, do. How much more historical evidence does someone need? And yet we understand, as Christ followers, we understand that there's a spiritual aspect here. People need to choose to, to open their spiritual eyes before the light goes on, and, and then they can see clearly. As believers, we, we need to pray into this. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. John 11. It's one thing to believe that Jesus rose from the dead, but it's a whole other thing to believe so much that you place your entire life and eternal future into the hands of God and, and fully trust Christ and what he did on the cross. And friends, friends, that's, that's the moment when death dies for you, eternal death, eternal separation from God, in that moment of surrender is no longer your experience or your destiny. 
The moment you die to yourself and surrender to Jesus Christ, recognizing what he did for you on the cross in paying your penalty, my penalty for sin, and receiving his forgiveness as we trust him, then that's, that's the moment that death dies for you and for me. And you, you no longer need to fear death at that point. You need to know, if you don't already, that believing, as the New Testament defines it, is, is not merely saying uh, that you believe certain facts. It, it's, not, it's not merely a, a mental assent to a set of truths. Even, even the truths about who Jesus is and what he did on the cross. Believing, as God defines it in the Bible, is giving your life over and into the hands of the one in whom you say you believe, Jesus Christ, the God of the universe. He is. True belief is is getting in the wheelbarrow with the tightrope walker, like Pastor Joel shared uh, the story about in his message on March 12th. Uh, uh, I might say as well, effectively stealing the illustration that I had intended to share with you here. Uh, but, but you need to know, I've, I've forgiven him for that. Uh, <laughs> if you miss that, a good message and that excellent illustration, you can catch that on our Eaglemont Church uh, YouTube channel, uh, Sunday uh, March 12th, Saturday, Sunday, I, I forget which we are here. So for death to die in your life, it will take embracing the life that Jesus Christ came to offer you through his death and resurrection. And again, if he didn't rise from the dead, we've got nothing. But you owe it to yourself, I would say to explore this very carefully. A solid case for the resurrection and for the important reason for it has, has just been presented to you. Now, the ball's in your court if you're a seeker, if you're not sure, if you've been on a, on a search, maybe, maybe for months or years, and, and this message just helps to crystallize the, the core truth of why you should step across that line of faith and become a Christian. And so this, today I ask you, would, would you respond today? Would you respond by surrendering your life to Christ and, and trusting him as the forgiver of your sin to remove that barrier between you and him and the leader of your life so that in, in, in this moment of expressed faith in God, death will die. Separation will no longer be your experience and you'll be united in a personal and eternal relationship with Jesus Christ. What could possibly keep you from choosing that? And so in this moment, I'm gonna ask you if that's your desire to step into, by simple faith, the Bible says, to step into that kind of relationship with God your Father, God your Creator, who wants to be your Father as you surrender to Christ. In this moment, you can pray something like this and say, Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for loving me. I thank you, Jesus, that you came to die for me. I receive the gift of your forgiveness because you paid the penalty for my sin on the cross. Thank you for that. I want to follow you. Show me how to live this life as a Christ follower. Help me to know and love your word. Help me to connect with other believers who will strengthen and encourage me. I commit my life to you now, in Jesus' name, amen. If you did that, that's so awesome. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that the angels are rejoicing right now about that decision that you've made to become a Christ follower. And you'll see a QR code on the screen right now. Um, just uh, that, that's a, you can scan that and there's a form that then you can fill out to let us know that you made that decision. We just, we just wanna be excited with you and come alongside and, and help you with some resources and so forth to, to help you as you put down roots in this, uh, your new relationship with God. So thank you for engaging today. Our hope is that you'll discover and grow in the true meaning of Easter. Happy Easter and God bless you.